Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about Gentiles two dimensions taxonomy. Um, so in the previous video, I talked about one dimension classification systems for motor skills. Um, but it, you know, one dimensional classification systems are not very complete. They're not um, very thorough. There's a lot missing. They don't, they don't capture the complexity of most movements. Um, so Dr. Antoinette Gentile, uh, developed this classification system that takes into consideration two characteristics instead of one, and then also further subdivides those and ends up with 16 different skill categories instead of just two extremes on one spectrum. Uh, Dr. Gentile was a brilliant neuromotor researcher. Um, I say was, she passed away a few years ago, but she had a long, brilliant career and contributed enormously to this field. Um, so along the way, she developed this uh, classification system for uh, motor skills, and it is widely accepted and used across the, the field. Um, so the two characteristics that are taken into consideration are the environmental context and the function of the action. And then again, there are kind of sub areas of those two characteristics. So then we end up with 16 different categories. It's used a lot in physical therapy and it was actually originally developed for use in physical therapy, but it's also very useful for anyone that's involved in teaching or training motor skills, whether it's in rehabilitation um, or with children or with athletes learning skills. Um, and it demonstrates that a small change can significantly increase the demands on the performer. So if we can understand what the demands are on the performer and understand um, how the difficulty or the complexity builds, depending on what we change, that can help us to plan our, our training strategies or our rehabilitation strategies more effectively uh, because it gives a really clear kind of roadmap to, you know, this ability leads to that ability leads to that ability and so on. Um, so starting with the first characteristic, that's the environmental context. Um, so it con considers two characteristics of the environmental context itself. So regulatory conditions, which really means is it an open or closed skill, as we discussed in the previous video, and intertrial variability, meaning um, is there a lot of variability from one uh, execution of the skill to the next? So like if they do it five times, was there a lot of variability in the performance or was it pretty consistent? And that's the intertrial variability. So for regulatory conditions, meaning open or closed skill, uh, it's the features of the environment to which movements must conform to achieve the action goal, uh, refers to the characteristics of the environment and not the performer. Okay, so this is where we're considering the features of the environmental context, just like I discussed in the previous video. Um, so we're looking at supporting surface, like are we on a sandy beach or are we on concrete or grass or somewhere else? Um, what objects are involved, if any? Um, and are other people or animals involved? And so here, just like how we discussed in the previous video, it could be stationary, meaning not in motion or in motion. Um, then the intertrial variability, so it's either present or not. So there either is variability from one execution to the next, or there's consistency from one execution to the next. So whether the regulatory conditions during performance change from one attempt to the next. So is the environment changing? Um, almost always present when the conditions are in motion. Okay, so if the environmental context, if the conditions are in motion, then there's going to be variability every time. Like if we're playing basketball, there's going to be an enormous amount of variability because the different players on the court are going to always be in different locations and different locations relative to one another and so many other features and factors that must be considered. So if the, if how the skill is executed in that environmental context is different from event to event, then there is intertrial variability. Um, most common exception to this when there is motion is on a machine like a treadmill or a ball machine. So generally speaking, if there is motion involved, then there is intertrial variability. Um, the exception to that is if the motion is caused by a machine 
that is going to generate very, very consistent motion that is not different from time to time. So like if you put the treadmill on at the same speed and you do it three times in a row, there's not going to be intertrial variability, even though there is motion. And that's, you know, when machines are generating the motion, that's pretty much the only exception to that rule. When anything else is generating the motion, then there is intertrial variability. Um, Non-regulatory conditions are other features of the environment that can also influence the skill, but it's less direct than what we classify here as regulatory conditions. So like the color of an object, presence of spectators, weather, um, so like the color of a ball, you know, could make a difference in uh, performance of the skill because maybe the ball is more visible when it's in one color compared to another. Um, or maybe presence of spectators is more distracting um, if they're there compared to if they're not. Or, you know, maybe the sun is right in your eyes compared to if it's a cloudy day. Uh, so those are just some examples. Those are non-regulatory conditions, so features that can influence performance, but it's a bit less direct. Okay, so if we look at those two um, characteristics of environmental context, and we put them into this little chart, you can see on the left here, I put stationary regulatory conditions and in motion regulatory conditions. And then at the top, there's no variability and there is variability. And so then when we cross match those, we get four categories of skills based on whether it's different from one trial to the next and whether there's motion happening in that environment. Okay, then the next characteristic is function of the action. So this is determined based on whether the skill involves moving the body from one location to another and whether the skill involves an object. <clears throat> All right, so the two characteristics here, first is body orientation. So changing or maintaining of location. So there's either stability, meaning there's no change in body location, or there's transport, meaning the body moves from one place to another. So if there is no change in location, that could be like standing, um, doing any kind of action or, or movement that where you're staying in place, uh, shooting an arrow, and then if there is body transport, meaning you move from one place to another, then that could be like walking, rock climbing, swimming, anything where you're going from one place to another. Um, that also includes anything that's active, like walking, rock climbing, swimming, or passive, like riding an escalator. So if the location of your body changes from one place to another, that's body transport, even if you, it happened passively and you didn't have to actively make that happen. Uh, then the other characteristic is object manip manipulation. So whether or not an object is involved. Um, so if there is an object involved, that automatically makes the action more difficult than if there is no object involved. Uh, because the performer has to be able to manipulate the object correctly. Um, you have to be able to adjust body posture to accommodate for imbalance that's caused by the object. On some cases, the object is entering your <laughs> kind of space, um, not on your own timing. Like if you're receiving a pass in basketball or uh, you're going to hit a baseball and someone is pitching it to you. Um, so it makes it more challenging in all sorts of different ways, depending on what the task is. So again, this little chart shows on the left side whether or not there's an object involved. And on the top, whether or not the body is moved from one place to another. And so then if we cross check those, we end up with four categories. Okay, so here is if we factor in all of the different things that we just discussed. Okay, so on the top is the action function with all four possible variables. And on the left is the environmental context with all four different variables. And if we um, go across, now we've got 16 different categories based on whether uh, the body is moving from one place to another, whether there's an object involved, um, whether anything is moving, and whether there is variability from one trial to the next. So in this particular design in this table, 1A all the way at the top here is the easiest. 
and we're getting progressively more challenging as we move at a diagonal down to 4D that is the most challenging. So the easiest is up here where there's no object, the body is stable, meaning there's no body transport, we don't move to another place. Um, there's stationary conditions, so nothing is moving. And there's no variability, so nothing changes from one trial to the next. Okay, so that is the easiest scenario. And then as we move from left to right, and as we move from top to bottom, things get gradually more challenging as we add objects, we add body transport, we add variability, we add motion until we get all the way down to 4D, this last box that includes an object and movement of the body from one place to another and everything's in motion and there's variability from one trial to the next. So it's helpful to approach and classify uh, motor control this way because let's say we're in rehabilitation or somebody's learning a new skill, then we can find out where on this chart they already are, like what is their current ability and start there. And then it gives us a really clear path to help them improve and to kind of track and measure their improvement until we can work all the way up to wherever that skill ideally will be performed. Not every skill needs to be done at 4D. Like if the skill you're working on is yoga, you know, or you know, I guess that's many different skills within a giant category. Um, but let's say it's a certain yoga pose, you don't need to work up to 4D for a yoga pose if the object is just to hold still and, and you can stay in 1A. Uh, but if the goal is to be able to walk through a crowded mall carrying a baby and do it successfully, um, then you would work your way up from wherever that person currently is all the way up to being able to execute that skill. So practical application, um, classification, as I just described, is an early step in the analysis of the task. Um, so it helps us understand performance, environment, and the skill, and helps us understand what the performer needs to be able to do to be able to successfully complete that task. It also gives us a way to evaluate performance and improvement um, and to help us figure out what the problem is. Like maybe they can execute the skill correctly at 3B, but when they move to 3C, they have trouble. And so then you're able to detect what the difference is and see where the weakness is and what needs to be improved to be able to um, improve their performance. All right, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.